Hey. Awesome. 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 How are you guys doing? Fantastic. We're so excited to be here. Thank you guys for having I us. Know. Look at the enthusiasm. Give it up. Give it up for these guys. Um, so as you mentioned, we got Missy, but we got her, her parents here today. Uh, awesome folks. I have to say, I, I got a chance to interview Missy, but it was back in 2012. So I was telling her backstage we were going to pick up where we left off. So back in 2012, when I interviewed you, you were still in high school. Yep. Just finished London. And I think you had the prom next week. So I just want to ask, how, how did your high school prom go? My senior prom was fantastic. Yes. Did you, were I you love prom those queen I'm such, at the prom? Oh, no. We didn't do that. We were very, we had no, like, prom royalty. It was very... We're very based on equality and making mm -hmm. everyone feel beautiful and loved and popular. Uh -huh. So I totally all about that. Um, but it was great. It was so fun. I get so into like dressing up and I love to dance. If you don't know that about me, that's the only thing you need to know. <laughs> and so I had like the time of my life. <laughs> yes. So I know when we spoke back then, see, we're going to go through a time, time warp here. I've gotten a lot older. You look the same. I told you that. Um, your superhero like persona, you described your life as Hannah Montana. Are we still in Hannah Montana land? Where are we now? Where are we We're now? We're definitely still in Hannah Montana land. We are land. still in Hannah yes. Montana? All right, even though Miley... Uh, like this trip, this is my Hannah Montana trip. Like I really have to channel my inner like Missy Franklin to really come out for this trip. And then I go home and it's like, okay, just Missy again. Do you want to explain the Hannah Montana thing? So the Hannah understand. Montana thing, it's just so surreal for me. Like this whole experience, it's crazy to think that swimming has brought me so many amazing opportunities and has introduced me to so many incredible people and taken me all over the world that it's just, it's so crazy to me. It feels like I'm living a double life. So hence, Hannah Montana. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So we're gonna get into uh, the book today, which I loved. We're gonna talk about uh, your upbringing, which I love as well. They did a really, I think you guys did a fantastic job with this book. I love that you get not just the athlete's story, but you get the parent's story right along with it and the parent's perspective which now is a new parent, I can't imagine what it would feel like to sit there watching my kids compete. Um, but I, d I did want to say one thing to you before we got too deep, is that I'm extremely, extremely proud of you. Um, I was proud of you after London and watching you at Rio, I couldn't have been prouder. Um, as an athlete, like you have ups and downs, I know it's hard to have a down at some, one of the biggest stages, but I just want to say this to you. In like what probably was a rough competition, you came home with an Olympic gold medal. And so if you want to put things in perspective, <laughs> you came home on a bad day with an Olympic gold medal. So. Thank you. And I'm, I'm not going to cry. Um, so uh, DA and Dick, how are you guys doing? Great. You just made me cry. I know, I know. That's the goal. I'm trying to go Oprah level here. I was trying to hold back my emotions. I thought, now he's going to ask me a question too. I can just feel it coming. <laughs> We're really proud of her, too. Yeah. Yeah. It was an incredible time, and we talk about it in the book. Um, go through Olympic trials. We go through Rio. And those were tough chapters to write. Missy, I think, did an incredible job. Um, and through the whole book, it was very interesting because it was an emotional book to write, and I had no idea it would be. We laughed. We cried. And I cried more and more. We'd be sitting down talking, and Missy would look at me and go, oh, here goes mom again. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, as you said, as an athlete, I was reading it, and I almost think it's a better book because of it, because you really get something real, I think. And everyone struggles. There's not one person in any, whether it's athletic career or anything else, that um, doesn't struggle. So I almost thought it was, because it was raw, it just seemed like I got emotional reading it, and I felt like I felt like I was there and, and what that would feel like. And... Uh, but as I said, I, I, I can't imagine a better person to like handle it, and I think that's what makes a, a champion, and you are a true champion. Um, and I, and I, I know this is just gonna be like one, one thing that's gonna make you even stronger. Um, and, and honestly, more people are gonna relate to you. Like someone out there struggling is gonna see that and see how you carried yourself and move forward, so. Yeah, we had, um, I got one email from this little girl back um, when I came home from Rio. And she just wrote me and said, you know, I've been going through a really hard swim meet. I was super disappointed. And then I reminded myself, you know, remember how Missy acted during the Olympics and she was having a disappointing meet. Like, you need to channel that and you need to act like that. And that one email seriously made it all worth it, you know, to think that I was able to help this one young swimmer as she was going through a tough meet to keep her, her chin high and, and, you know, keep pushing through it. Like... That's why I do it. So that was really special, just getting that one note from this one little girl. It meant the world to me. 
And I thought this book was definitely deeply personal. I wonder how much you actually learned about your parents. I went through this, I, I had a book a few years ago, and like, you're like, oh, what did my parents do when they were young? And it's like things that you think would be obvious to know. Was, was there anything that surprised you? Like, think, did you already know all this stuff, or were, was there a reveal as you no, were sort of No, it was this? definitely more in-depth than we had ever been before. Um, for, for people who haven't read it, my parents are incredibly vulnerable and open about their childhoods, and they weren't easy by any means. They were really challenging, and I, I knew that they had had difficult childhoods, but I don't think I ever knew just how difficult. And so hearing my parents tell me their stories from their own mouths and listening to what they went through is incredibly hard because it just makes me question like you know how was I born into such a wonderful family with such wonderful people and that was just what I was given where that's not the case with everyone so uh, it was it was hard but I'm so proud of them for being so open and I think it'll help people give a lot of insight into our family so I know um, I, you guys told me the story but the two of you met on a double date but you were not each other's date <laughs> Exactly. Let's get right to the juicy <laughs> gossip. Exactly. So how did uh, how how did that work out? <laughs> worked, it worked very out. Well. It worked out very well. <laughs> but uh, for someone, uh, how, how do you pull that off? Maybe it was Dick who pulled that off. How, how do you how do you go from double date with someone else to? Uh... Well, it was it was natural. <laughs> I mean, um, we were there with two respective dates, and when they went off dancing, and we spent the night talking, and. Six months later, the we're, evening talking. Yes. <laughs> In six months. Wait, what did he say? I missed the. <laughs> he said the night talking. Oh she, yeah, gotcha. She clarified it was she just clarified. the evening. <laughs> we're, that's, this is she the gossip we need, guys. That. She wanted to clarify that. <laughs> but, and then you guys, you had a break apart, and you ended up at the same college. Yeah, we had a break. Uh, I went. Away, I went away to try for pro ball in Toronto with the Argonauts and then I and then I came back from my masters my MBA and we met up again and that was 45 years ago. Did you did you know she was at the same school? Was that part of the yeah, the plan? Yeah, that was part of the plan. <laughs> no. Wow. No, it was <laughs> no, no, we really didn't. It was... I fell in love that first night on that double date and I went home and told my sister. I said, "I have met the man I'm going to marry." And she said, "I know. You've been going out with him for a while." I said, no, no, I've met someone else. And she was <laughs> shocked. Um, and then, is it true that you proposed after three weeks once you were back at college? Sort of. Sort of. Literally the worst proposal story you've ever The worst proposal hear. story ever. <laughs> Do we have to go it, into this? Yes, yeah, this is the best. This is the juicy <laughs> stuff. I love it. So I'm like such a hopeless romantic. Like I love giant romantic gestures and just over the top stuff. And so they were just, you know, finished dinner one night. We're just sitting together on the couch. And my dad looks over at my mom and goes, you'd make a really good wife. And mom was like, thank you? Like, I appreciate that. And then, like, a couple minutes of silence. And my dad goes, so what's your answer? <laughs> my mom was like, to what? <laughs> He's like, I just proposed to you. No, you didn't. <laughs> it was a football player proposal, right? <laughs> Somehow it still worked. <laughs> so when someone proposes to you, Missy, they're gonna have to do a better job. I love you, Dad, but <laughs> yeah, they're gonna have to do a little bit a little bit better than that. <laughs> Believe me, I'll be watching. <laughs> so I know you talk about this in the book. I know it's again, I think a def definitely deeply personal subject, but you had Missy kind of um, like later stages. Um, I know it was something that you thought maybe wouldn't have happened. So maybe you could talk a little about um, I don't know, the, the miracle that is Missy, how she's here standing with you today, and um, kind of how that, I guess, came about. <laughs> do you want to talk? Or do you you go ahead, sweetie. Unfortunately, and, but fortunately, um, like a lot of people, I suffered from infertility. And we went through years and years of struggling, trying to figure out how to have our family. We wanted to have a family. Uh, we looked at various options. We looked at adoption. but we moved a lot in our um, careers. And every state, of course, has different adoption forms, papers, procedures to go through. And that just wasn't going to work for us. And then one day, I was looking at the People magazine. And in the cover, it had surrogacy. And I'm a physician, and so I knew about sur surrogacy. And I thought, I wonder if that could be an option for us. And I talked to Dick about it, who was skeptical, because he, he didn't want especially me to get hurt. Um, and we ended up doing the surrogacy route, found an absolutely wonderful woman who 
carried Missy for us. And it may not have worked for everyone, but it sure worked for us, and look what we ended up getting. <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I, I honestly thank you guys, because I think being personal and, and with the profile you guys have, like when my wife and I were starting to try to have kids, it just seemed like everyone, it was so easy. Like all you just saw was like, oh, everyone just decides to have a kid and they have it. And it wasn't until we started to try to have our, our twins, who are now 14 weeks, that we realized how many people, you know, it was taking time. And then all of a sudden people were coming to us. And it's, it's sort of interesting when you're going through something and then you realize how many other people are out there, but everyone kind of mm -hmm. keeps quiet. So, um, and I think, you know, obviously everything works out for a reason. And um, you guys are both in an incredible, posi incredible position in your lives to, yeah. to raise this Olympic gold medalist here. Um, what I, I do want to ask now, just to get into sort of like swimming and uh, Missy's childhood, because I think there's a lot in the book that's really great for parents. I know I was reading it now with a keen eye towards uh, <laughs> how do I raise my own little Olympians? <laughs> but uh, so Missy, originally you got into swimming, just you guys put her in for safety. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and that was the most important thing to us, because my mom didn't learn how to swim until later on in her life. Um, and she's never, correct me if I'm wrong, but never been quite 100% comfortable around the water. And I knew she didn't want me to be like that whatsoever. So we did the mommy and me class when I was six months old. And I essentially just didn't get out of the water after that. But we really just wanted me to be safe. And that's one of my favorite things about swimming is it's the only sport that will save your life and the only sport that you can do for the rest of your life. And, you know, it's not just a sport. It's a life skill. And so to have my mom be willing to get over her fear in order to make sure that I wouldn't have that fear was incredible. We actually say that in fencing too, but maybe it's more applicable. So <laughs> don't take our stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. No, so that's sorry. probably more true. It's, You're not. Totally the odds of you dying in a street fight are very low with swords. The odds of maybe <laughs> getting into a pool accident are higher. So that kind of put things in perspective for me. Um, when did you really start to swim competitively and compete? So I started on my summer club team when I was five. I wanted to start when I was four, but they wouldn't let me. Uh, so I was on Heritage Green Gators for two summers before I realized that just doing it in the summer was not going to be enough for me. So I started on the Colorado Stars, which is a year-round club team, when I was seven. And my first day was the very first day of the Starfish. That's what group I was in. Uh, our Starfish coach, Todd Schmitz. And we ended up working together for 11 years and going to our first Olympics together. And I thought it was interesting. You, you have this sort of phrase. I'm sure you're going to get this question a lot, but... And I was in, and now as a coach as well, but the difference between motivating and enabling. So you really viewed your job as enabling Missy versus sort of motivating her. Maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think we felt strongly that, you know, we'd, we'd seen overzealous parents living their lives vicariously through their children and pushing too hard. You know, the, the, fo the football father pushing the son and clearly seeing the son's not in the game. You know, and, and we didn't want to be that way. We really wanted it to be Missy's choice. And our lesson was paying attention and waiting for the lights to go on. And when it came to swimming, the lights went on. I mean, we didn't have to do anything. She loved it. She motivated herself. We didn't have to motivate her. So as parents, we went from not motivating but to enabling. All right, this is her passion. This is her love. This is her dream. How can we help her make it happen? Was there like a aha moment of seeing Missy swim when you're like, this could be really something special? Was it at five, or was there a moment you just thought this? You it know? was. It was really our our friends who are much more proficient in swimming. We had neighbors and ex Olympians and master swimmers. Um, because, as you just heard, D.A. wasn't much of a swimmer. I was a ball player. I didn't know anything about a backstroke <laughs> or a breaststroke. But when our friends that know the sport technically came to us, and they'd say to us, you know she's the real deal, right? What do you mean? No, no, we're telling you she's the real deal. Pay attention, because that girl's going to be somebody someday. And it was from them that, that we got encouraged and enabled even farther in the way we went. Tim, one important thing that I think we should say is that Missy did just about every sport you can imagine. And we encouraged those, we enabled those, we just had one rule. And that was if you commit to the team, you're part of that team, 
for however long the season goes. Then if you decide you don't like it, you stop, but you don't stop in the middle of a season. That's not fair to you, your coach, or your team. And so that's one rule we had. And Missy decided herself when she was going to stop different sports, when she wasn't giving enough to the team. And right up to high school, she did volleyball and swimming. And then she stopped because the t commitment was too great with the swimming and wanting to go to Olympic trials. I want to ask you, what, do you, what did you first fall in love with with swimming, and what do you love about swimming? Oh, my gosh. Because I'm fascinated, because I don't think I could ever be a swimmer. Um, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't feel like I have the <laughs> attention span to go back and forth. For four hours for a day? For four hours a day. What? So I'm with what, you. Is it, what is it that makes, I feel like you have to be a little bit crazy a little, to oh, do that. Oh, for sure. So 100%. what is it? Um, you know, there's so much. To me, swimming is so therapeutic. I can either go in, and it doesn't matter if I'm having a great day or the worst day of my life, I can go in, dive into the pool, and know that for the next two hours, there's literally nothing else I can do except get better in the pool. There's no emails I can send. There's no homework I can do. There's no studying. It's literally just me and the pool. And it's so isolating that I just love being in there and being able to think about everything that's on my mind or think about absolutely nothing at all. Which is so interesting because you're such a like social person, but you enjoy the isolation of, of being I do. In the pool. And then of course I'm with all my teammates too, which is so fun. So every time we go to the wall with our like 15 seconds rest, we're telling jokes and laughing and talking about our day. But for the majority of practice, right, we're just head in, just kicking away. So London, it seems like everything's going right. Maybe we can just go a little bit on the journey from London to Rio. I know after London, um, obviously. You know, you I think the next World Championships, you did incredible. You had well. Let's talk about your first big decision. You decided not to go pro um, after the London Olympics and to go to go to school. So maybe we can talk about how you, how did you make that decision? Um, is it do you view it now the right decision? Yeah, what, let's. So for a little bit of background, um, I really wanted to swim in college. I for sure was going to go to college no matter what, but I wanted to be a part of a collegiate team. And in order to do that, to remain eligible, I was not allowed to accept any kind of money and any kind of endorsement, sponsors, anything like that. So after London, um, essentially turned everything down. And it was really challenging. We had a lot of conversations about it as a family. But again, my parents enabled and told me everything I needed to know were honest about their opinions and let me make my own decision, which was I want to stay amateur and I want to be able to swim in college. So I decided to go to the University of California, Berkeley, and swim two years collegiately there and then turn professional before Rio. I'd make the same decision 100 times over again. I'm so happy I did it. Um, I always say I knew the girls on my college team were going to be like the bridesmaids at my wedding. And <laughs> I just don't think you can put a price on that. And you can't. And I was shown that. And so I went to, um, I had my senior year of high school left. I went to world championships that next year, won six golds there. So I was really excited about that. Uh, came off, went to college, um, and then that first year, I suffered my first injury right before our major competition. So that was a process of then coming back from that. And then the next year, decided to uh, move back home and train with Todd again, leading up to World Championships in 2015 and the summer of 2016. So that was the hardest decision I've ever had to make because I left everything at school. I left my apartment, my best friend, my teammates, everything out there, but I felt like it was going to be the best position for me moving forward with so many changes going on in my life. And, you know, the, that world in Rio this, this summer was obviously pretty disappointing for me, and it's so hard to put so much of your effort into something and so much of your heart and make so many sacrifices for it and fall so far short of where you think you're capable of. But it also really gave me the opportunity to be the person I've always said that I want to be in those difficult situations. So for that, I'm really grateful. Do you think the, because you talk a lot about um, your sport as a relationship. I actually always tell people it's like you're, you're really marrying your sport if you want to go to the Olympics. you got to love it, and there's going to be good times and bad, and you're going to have to, like, work through it. Um, so I know you talked about sort of the Olympics, like, falling, maybe falling a little bit, like, breaking up with your sport a little bit or having a fight with your sport. How much was, do you think, turning pro added a pressure to you? Or what? where do you think that sort of change started to occur? Because you, know, you did, I everyone was, talked about you in London just, like, yeah, look like you were... Yeah, I think like it was were... way more internal <laughs> than anything because my sponsors... I have the best sponsors in the entire world, and they were so supportive no matter what. I mean, they never put any kind of pressure on me. They just wanted me to go out there and have fun and do my best, and that's how I knew I, I choose the right companies to partner with, but I think it was, it was more internal of me caring so much about not wanting to disappoint
disappoint others, that I let that weight really just sit on me, and it just became crushing. And so I got to this summer, and it was all that I was focusing on. Instead of just going out there and seeing how good I could be, it was more about going out there and doing everything I could not to let other people down. And so being able to reflect on that and realize that that's not why I do this and kind of taking a couple steps back and going back to the little girl that fell in love with the water and channeling that again, this has been a, a really crucial time for me to do that. I always think sometimes it's easier to be a young athlete because you don't worry about what everything means. And I think everyone goes to that transition where you start to like think about sort of who you are, but almost externally, and what everything means, and what does it mean to do this, and what does it mean to do that. Um, and that's a challenging, it's a challenging place to get to, but a strong, you know, a place to work through that makes you even kind of stronger. Um, I do want to ask, so for folks that are picking up this book, like, what do you want them to take away um, from your story? Where, where, do, where are we? Obviously, your story is just being written, so I'm ready for, for version <laughs> two, for, for part two of this. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be at least a trilogy um, with your life, so where, where are we, where should we take from this, and, and where are we going? I think one of the big themes throughout the book for us is just staying true to who we are as a family, you know, and stay true to who you are as a person. You're going to have so many different opinions, so many different things that are being thrown at you, and stay true to you. Stay true to what makes you happy, what makes your family happy, and what's going to put you guys in the best position, and that's what we did. We had so many different people coming up to us telling us we should move here, that I should train with this coach, that I should do this, that I should do that, and we just said, no, we're happy. Like, we're good right where we are, and we talked everything everything through. We had incredible open communication. And to us, we just want to share that with people and say it's, it's okay to do it your way and it's actually the best thing for you to do. So I hate it when people ask me if I was going for the next Olympics like one hour after I was done. But now that I'm in this role, I have to ask you. So I'm just a huge hypocrite. But uh, Tokyo? <laughs> Tokyo, would, anyone? 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 <laughs> anyone? Uh, I would love to. I would love to. It's definitely something I would be incredibly honored to attend a third Olympics. But just like you said, right now it's about being in the present. And I know that if that's my long-term goal, then I need to do something every day now to get better. The next Olympian I have on, there's like 10 questions that I hate as an Olympian. The next Olympian, I'm just going to go into all those questions. <laughs> it's going to be like, are you going for 2024? Four. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, all right, so I think we got some audience questions out here. We're uh, right here. Welcome. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for just your example of character and sportsmanship at the highest level. Really appreciate that, especially as a middle school teacher, seeing young kids uh, look up to you. Um, you mentioned the Hannah Montana conflict of you know being so much in the spotlight and I wondered what are your keys to staying balanced and staying grounded in your identity beyond the sport yeah so a huge part of that is my parents of course um, you know just knowing that they've loved me from the start and they're gonna love me to the end uh, no matter what happens and a huge part of it is also my faith um, I'm, I'm a Christian and for me just having downtime where I can pray, be in my own space with God, and just reflect on, on my relationship with him. It, it really helps keep things in perspective, which to me has been the most important thing with balance is, you know, it helps me realize that I'm loved because of who I am as a person and not because of what I can do in a pool. I love you talk about you can get messages from anywhere. Like your big takeaway on the way home was like a random conversation with a guy in a plane who didn't know where you were. You guys have to read the book if you want to get the story, but all right, we we'll got keep another. It very vague. Yes, it's a good, it's a good one. Right over there. Hello. For each of you, what was your relationship with writing, literature, and storytelling before this project began? Well, I love your hair, first of all. It's so <laughs> fierce and fabulous. Um, language arts class, sixth grade. <laughs> um, I've always loved to write. I love to read. I'm a total bookworm. And I think writing a book has always been something I've just, you know, wildest of wildest dreams. So to actually do it, is just so surreal, um, but I really didn't have any experience, especially not professional experience. It was more of just me. I've been a huge journaler my whole life, but that's essentially it for me. I was exactly the same way. I'm a huge reader. Um, I was a teacher in terms of teaching nursing students and teaching medical students, and so just putting together lectures and those types of things, but nothing formal in journalism or writing. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. We got uh, right over there. Hello. Hi. Uh, huge fan. I actually swam in college, so I uh, am beyond fangirling right now. Um, so a lot of people talk about swimming being a very uh, physical sport. It's extremely grueling. Um, 
Can you talk about how emotionally, how it is to get out of your head and how to keep the sport fun? Yeah, absolutely. So I think any elite athlete would agree that the mental aspect is almost more important than the physical aspect because you can be in the best shape of your life, but if you're not there emotionally and mentally, it doesn't matter. Um, so of course the training is important so that you're there, but I think that mental and emotional aspect is really underrated sometimes and it's so crucial and it is so important to remember why you're doing it and to have fun with it because if you can put yourself in this situation where you've worked as hard as you possibly could, you're in that best shape of your life, you do just need to get out there and go race, which is the best part and it's the best feeling to have that. So a lot of times um, I have a, a confidence jar and so anytime I like have a good practice or go a good time at a meet, like I write these things down in my confidence jar and then before I go to a big meet, I just like dump out the whole jar and go through all this stuff right before I race. Um, which is kind of fun because you can do that for so many different aspects of your life. You can do it for your job. If you're having a down day, you can just open up your confidence jar and just feel better about yourself. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, moments like that where you look back and appreciate the hard work and the sacrifices that you've put in. Awesome. We got one more question right here. How are you? Hi, guys. Okay, so I have two questions, and you guys are so amazing. Um, uh, one is for Mr. and Mrs. Franklin, and then the other one for Missy. Um, how did you go about selecting the stories that you wanted to tell about Missy and about her life and trying to keep it balanced between swimming and just her being her personality? And then Missy, um, did you, you, you mentioned learning things about your parents, but did you learn anything about yourself that you may have forgot, like any stories or events when you were a little kid uh, from the book? Those are great questions. And uh, I think that the book changed, and what we shared changed as it developed and we talked. I'm not sure that we were going to talk about everything the way we did when we first started out. Um, it was very, very important to Missy to be authentic, and we talked about that as well. The surrogacy, at first, I mean, it was, it was an incredible part of our lives, and we're very, very proud of it. It was our way of producing our family, and it worked for us. Did we want to tell that to the world? I'm not sure if we did at first. But as we started to talk more and more about the book, we realized the important thing was our family. And how could we share things about our family and the way we did things without talking about the very, very special, beautiful way that we produced Missy? I don't know if that answers your question, but it did change. The book morphed a lot as we went on. And that's, we got more and more emotional as we went through the book and sharing stories and deciding to share them with, with everyone else. Anything to add? <laughs> she said it. <laughs> uh, this kind of goes off their question, too. Uh, so it's perfect. But I learned so much about myself. And I've been saying I think everyone needs to write a book about their life just because of the reflective experience that it is. And we would go through, and in terms of picking stories, you know, our ghostwriter was incredible, and he would just start bringing up topics, and we'd start jumping from, from moment to moment. And you look back on these moments that might have seemed completely insignificant that actually had so much meaning in developing who you were as a person. So, you know, I talk a lot about my very first meet as a national teamer. I was 13, and, you know, this one moment that I had there, and it ended up being like such an incredible base for the rest of my career, where at the time, of course, I'm not thinking that. But as I look back, I'm like, wow, like that was really a crucial moment for me. So it's been an incredible reflective experience. And then for me too, especially the Rio chapters at the end were really hard because we did that, you know, in the raw emotion. It was right after everything happened. So to write all of that stuff down while I was still feeling the way that I was feeling was incredibly challenging. But I think it really helped me work through some of that stuff and grow because of it. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys. I want to thank you guys for being just incredible role models, just the way you guys conduct yourselves, winning or losing. As I said, the whole family, you guys are champions. I want to thank you guys for coming on. I think this is a really great book, Relentless, Relentless Spirit. I think I, I appreciate how authentic you guys were. You definitely did it. I think it definitely is going to touch a lot of people. I think you're going to help a lot of people with this book, and I know really that's what you guys are about doing. So uh, I'm a fan. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Please send them off thank properly. AOL Build. Dick, D.A., and Missy Franklin.